Okay, so I'll be careful then. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, no comments about Brexit. It's all going to be fine. Um, so I think firstly, I think on behalf of the, the group, many, many thanks for a fantastic presentation, rich opportunities. That, that's the good part. This is a bit of devil's advocacy. Uh, so if I survey the history of UK education system engagement with Colombia or Chile or Brazil, I see a landscape of dispersal. So lots of time invested, including since St. Fronteras, and actually very, very small returns. Uh, how are you going to ensure that the follow-through gives us a sustainable long-term impact? That's the devil's advocate question. Excellent. 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 Wonderful question. I want to call the prosecutor question, not the devil. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Mario, would you like to begin? No, no, please go ahead. No, I can, I can, I can follow. Well, I tried to pass the hardball to Professor Mario, okay. but, uh, uh, well, we, First of all, I, I've always been a strong critic of uh, Science Without Borders, Ciencias Sem Fronteras. I thought, um, some of my colleagues thought it was at least a good marketing piece. I would argue that even if it was a good marketing piece, it was an extremely expensive one, as over 15 billion reais uh, were spent on it. Um, that's an awful amount of money, and we, um, we knew that someday the, the bill would arrive, and the bill has arrived, right? Uh, print, uh, and uh, I have said that this man, many times, print, I think it's an improved version of Science Without Borders, right? Um, the amount of money that is being spent here compared to Science Without Borders is not as great, it's 1.2 billion reais compared to 15 billion reais, um, not an awful lot of money. Um, it has the potential of developing stronger partnerships, however, as it's better structure, right? All the, it's, the cooperation is done between universities. It's not simply sending undergraduate students abroad without any sort of um, later responsibility. Um, but I believe that more important than putting everything, putting all the, uh, all the eggs in one basket, is to, is to have a clear strategy of what you want to achieve with internationalization and how you are going to achieve it and make sure that govern, government programs, they are part of your strategy, not your entire strategy. Because governments change, right? We've had uh, some very different governments in the last 30 years, from military dictatorship to, an ex, to, uh, lab, to the Labour Party, to the extreme uh, right-wing uh, candidate right now. I mean, those are very different governments. But one thing that's very important uh, to state is that the university has survived over, it's fairly recent in Brazil, but it has survived under very different governments. It has actually thrived under very different governments. Um, and if we are able to implement a certain strategy, as we've been doing here, and convincing the community that that's, that is the best way to do, um, you, with, with time, um, independently of what government gives you or takes from you, um, their cooperation will be sustainable. Uh, how successful will be Brexit? No, no, just uh, now I'm being the prosecutor here. <laughs> so, <clears throat> no, you don't have to answer that. 
<laughs> That's a hard question. Any one of us <laughs> yeah. so, oh, no. Just, just, just wake, wake you up. Uh, <laughs> anyhow, uh, I partially agree uh, what has been said. Um, one of the key problems with uh, science without borders, uh, in my perspective, was that it lacked good planning, okay? And uh, the idea in itself is not, is not bad, but uh, without planning, uh, the outcome uh, may be not uh, as much as we expect, right? But uh, I disagree that the, if I could say so, the results are not in yet. Because somehow I believe the, what happened to many of these students in several degrees was very different. To some of them, the impact was tremendous. Some, you know, you, but this happens if, if we believe this is a Gaussian distribution. No, I don't know if it is. It's a large number. But uh, we may get some very good results out of it. Now, was it worthwhile in terms of uh, cost benefit? We'll see, right? But I agree. Uh, I remember very vividly when the, <laughs> the idea or the, actually the, the program came out, how it was implemented here. And you, you have, we do have some structure to do that. And what I believe lacked the most was a very uh, strong tie and commitment from the um, institution abroad. Because many of them, most of them did not know what actually was going on, right? And uh, collaboration, this is me again, sorry. Collaboration does not happen uh, by law. You understand what I say? If you come out with a law, that you must collaborate, collaborate does not happen. Collaboration does not happen that way, in my perspective. So I believe uh, what is different now, from my perspective, first, there has been more planning. Second, what I do hope, and that's my criticism about Brazil as far as science is concerned, we unfortunately do not have a long-term plan for science. That's my perspective, right? Okay, we are much younger than Great Britain, <laughs> okay? We are much younger than other countries. We're still learning. Science in Brazil, I would say, is about 50 years of age. So it's very young. So I believe it's part of growing up. It's part of maturity. We can do better because we can learn from other people's mistakes. But uh, in this case specifically, uh, what I do expect, I do hope, that the outcome will be much better because there has been more planning. The very fact that you are here for us is very encouraging because we can see that somehow you also believe in this planning, okay? So that, as much as I could answer. Then you can tell me later about Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me just quickly react to this very provocative question brought up by our friend Colin Grant. Uh, first of all, and maybe it's just my political science background speaking now, but uh, I'm afraid that what applies to the, the whole of Brazil doesn't apply to higher education in the same way at least, because our higher education uh, bureaucracy is growing more and more mature and consistent over time. And I, I would go as far as to, to affirm that Science Without Borders is kind of an outlier and a bad outlier. I agree with Professor Saliba's uh, interpretation to a large extent. It is a poorly tailored policy, uh, which was very much uh, looking for uh, some worldwide recognition for 
like placing Brazil on the map, but the wrong way. So uh, it consisted basically of uh, dispatching 100,000 Brazilian students, undergrad students, throughout the world. Uh, but at the end of the day, it served actually as a convenient way for the middle and upper classes to send their kids to have a beautiful European trips and to, to get to know a list of like 15 or 20 countries in a year. Uh, well, there's one very curious fact about Science Without Borders, which Professor Campos sometimes calls uh, borders without science. And he's got good reasons for that. <laughs> he's the one <laughs> who is in charge of research and science, so uh, he knows what he's speaking of. But uh, Brazil has sent more students to Hungary, a country with which we hardly maintain <laughs> cooperation at any level, more than uh, more students to Hungary than to the the sum of all Asian countries: Japan, China, South Korea, Taiwan included, India included. So it tells a little bit about how uh, miscalibrated this program was from the beginning. From it was flawed by design. With all due respect, I'm sorry, I Professor. I don't think you've uh, answered the question. So I'm David, I'm David Wilson from the University of Southampton. So Colin used to be, uh, yeah, with t <laughs> <laughs> so with, with the greatest respect, you've answered a different question. You've identified what you shouldn't do. So the, like, the question is, what do you need to put in place for it to be sustainable? And I think, this, I think the answer is really simple. Because if you analyze the uh, institutions that have done this successfully, the key element of researchers or the program directors meeting face to face, the two institutions, they like each other, they want to do business, they do research, they do exchange. And that's the, that's the solution to your graph of co-authorship. And that, I think they're the people that provide sustainability, the key, the key things progressing, and therefore um, I would make it easy for those people to, to meet. I would, um, uh, they need some resource for that um, uh, and, and reward that behavior. I don't, I don't mean salary, but in terms of um, uh, uh, reward um, in uh, whether well, sabbaticals or uh, uh, things that you identify it, um, provide them with promotion, and that behavior will be, um, uh, you know, uh, people will identify that elsewhere in the institution and want to replicate it. So I think the answer is simple. I agree with you, not Science Without Borders. My own personal opinion about um, Science Without Borders, it, it was very expensive marketing. Someone looking into Brazil, it demonstrated Brazilian ambition, but I think you, I think you sent the wrong students. You don't send undergraduates. You, 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 you know, only 20% were PhD students. I think that's where the, sh that's where the focus should have been. Very glad that you with uh, what you've just said, uh, Professor, because uh, I've been saying for years <laughs> that uh, we should, yeah, um, uh, that we should not have focused on sending undergraduate students abroad. I mean, this was, in my view, the worst mistake we made in designing this uh, program. Um, now it's quite evident that the program failed, uh, but uh, I think that uh, with print, uh, we have learned from past mistakes. I have to give CAPES uh, that recognition. But obviously, you, you, I cannot disagree uh, with the view that uh, cooperation, for cooperation to happen, professors have to talk. That's one of the things that we, that's why we have come up with the ideas of having the core tutels and the courses, undergraduate courses or graduate courses taught together using distance learning. Because unless you get two professors to talk a little bit and to hear, you know, and, and then think about what the other one is saying. It's very difficult um, to have cooperation. Obviously, we're willing to send people abroad, we're willing to receive people, but we know that there are, uh, there are limits to that. So we, wa we also want to take advantage of uh, uh, online technology in order to improve it. Uh, David and then. Okay, if I, I could then uh, move on from 
what we're planning to do and the investment in the mobility and these various other things, have you given some thought at this early stage about how you're going to measure this, how you're going to measure the, what, how this has been successful and perhaps that money put in a certain direction is being less successful than others? And I know that this is, this is a challenge because it takes time. You know, clearly, we already have researchers talking to each other, some who have already got uh, collaborations going well before this meeting, but it takes time for publications to come through. I've, I've seen that with some of our other partnerships at Glasgow where we've been looking at the, you know, I've been challenged. We have a scheme that funds mobility between certain partners, and the challenge to me is, well, how, how is this doing? And you, you talk to people, you can use the, the, the citation indices and the publication databases to find joint publications, but some things are just not able to be found that way. There will be publications which may not be jointly authored but have been um, helped by the mobility. There will be grant applications that have been made because they can only be made to, to FAPAMEG or to EPSRC there isn't a joint funding opportunity available, but the application has depended crucially on the input from, from the other partner. And the only way that I've found so far to do that is just go out and ask people. And it's a, it's a big job to try and do that. So I think it's important as you make your investments, and, and we also collaborate with that, to think about systematic ways in which we can keep up to date with how this is going. Yeah, I think that uh, I agree 100% with that. Uh, the point is what has been uh, discussed about this, uh, quote, I, an easier way to measure in the sense, and of course there is a lag, as you said, because there's a lag between the when the collaboration started and when you do have some research output, right? The easiest way to measure it, of course, is going through some of these uh, databases, right, and, and see see what is there, right? But I I don't I really don't know, and I if you know, I'll be willing to really willing to to hear what we have thought about. Of course, is using those tools that are available. Uh, but to measure the real impact, that's why I, you, you observe that my position concerning science without borders is slightly different, right? Be, maybe because I'm older, <laughs> I don't know. But I, I think the story has not ended yet. So uh, we don't know what actually happened, right? We know some objective way what happened maybe did not work according to some perspective, but there's much more that goes on. So when you're talking about people interacting, there's a lot more than just numbers in citation index and stuff like that. So that's why I said uh, collaboration does not happen because you have a program like print. You know what I mean? Uh, I don't know if I make myself clear. In order for the collaboration to happen, I agree with Professor Aziz, you need researchers to talk to each other. But that's just part of the problem in my perspective. If you allow me, one of the key issues, the real glue, if I could say so, are the students, right? If we make them move, I, of course, in terms of investment, we may think what would be the highest return. We may think of PhDs, right, maybe uh, postdocs and stuff. It, that's, that's true. So we have to actually uh, manage well the resources in terms of trying to obtain the highest return, the metric, we still have to find out the best metric, which dimension actually to measure. Some of them I think is very difficult. So I'll be, I would love to hear your perspective, your suggestions of other metrics that we can use to actually uh, measure that. Of a, uh, a PhD student to one of our partners or received one from them. We, we also have a, a small fund called our International Partnership Development Fund, which can then be used as a follow-on. Um, for example, to get together a group of researchers to have a, a workshop for a few days at 
either our, ourselves or the partner. But then, then things sort of fall flat. People then say, well, what can we do next? And what we're learning is we, we've had a, a number of discussions back home about this. One of our partners, the University of Sydney, had been participating in schemes that we'd initiated. They've since come back and said, actually, we're not going to do that now. We want to do things in a different way. And they have a mechanism which is almost, uh, well, we've got together, we've made some connections, um, how, how do we build on this? So they're looking at focusing their money now in bigger chunks in a small number of areas. So they're now moving towards uh, a system where it's a joint application from a principal investigator at Sydney, one at Glasgow. They're also doing this with other partners. And I think our aim is to make five awards of I can't remember, it's something like 40,000 Australian dollars for a group. So it's ta taking, it's moving on from just one student or one professor going in one direction or another to we actually have a really good idea for a joint project. We've got buy-in at both ends. We're involving two PIs. We've got some students perhaps involved as well. We promise almost that there will be publications and then research grant applications from this. So I think this may be a little bit down the line, but I think it would be good to be thinking about once we've developed a lot of these initial collaborations from the, the, the connections that we've made and the investments from print, what could you maybe be doing? Maybe this could be part of in four years' time when you had next have an opportunity to um, apply to print round three or whatever it is that um, you may have a different perspective but I think if you could be thinking in parallel with these developments that could be a good idea. Thank you very much Professor Fairn. Uh, uh, in the just before our colleague uh, uh, just before the, uh, uh, the our, co our colleague intervention uh, one uh, brief uh, reaction here is that I believe that um, on one hand, uh, the number of uh, publications, co-author publications, is perhaps uh, one of the best um, um, measures that we have. Uh, but I do agree that it takes time. So I would uh, think of, uh, as and we, we normally do it at the international office, we check the, how mobility is going, how many of our professors, students, uh, are going abroad, how many uh, people are coming uh, to FMG. I mean, I think that's one important measure of internationalization. Uh, the number of international seminars in which our professors are participating and in the number of seminars here at FMG in which we have foreign professors from uh, university partners. Uh, the number of courses uh, that will be offered online courses that will be offered in jointly with uh, uh, university partners. But additionally, I think that one of the advantages of selecting, as we plan to do, a number, a limited number of partners, not 430, but 40 or 30, right, is that um, you can follow very closely what is going on, as I know that you do with Glasgow. Uh, you know all the cooperation that is going on, who is coming, who is going, and you have you you can take the pulse at, at times and see if things are going uh, are improving or or getting worse. So it's um, one I think. It's one of the advantages of having fewer but better friends. So thank you. I'm Michael Vorländer from uh, RWTH Aachen University in Germany. And uh, we have excellent experience with several uh, research and uh, education exchanges with Brazil, actually with several universities. UFMEG is one of them. And um, it's, I support very much what was said before by my previous uh, 
uh, co what uh, colleagues uh, asked about, also th concerning funding opportunities of bilateral funding cooperation agreements between, in our case, DFG or DRD and CAPES and SEMPIK. This runs very well. This is not the threat I, I could imagine. This is, uh, we can find money, we can find good people. We can find particularly good people coming to Germany from Brazil. The threat, in my point of view, is to send people to Brazil, and the threat, the main reason is language. I, nev I didn't hear anything about language, and uh, if you talk about graduate exchange students and PhD level students, uh, double degree programs, Cocotel programs, and some of them have to pass um, courses here in Brazil which are taught only in Portuguese. It's, this is a real threat. You, you would find people who are willing to, to come to Brazil, which have family background or something, some reason for going to Brazil, but you might not find the best people in the scientific point of view, which you like to get for having the best impact in, in publications and so on. So I like to know if there is some, some measure on your side for gaining more courses in, in English language on graduate level. Well, thank you very much for that excellent question. Uh, we've had, uh, about two years ago, a debate over that with our um, predecessor. Um, there was a strong, uh, uh, it was difficult to convince people that we should work on improving the number of courses in English at the university. Um, after taking, um, after beginning our term, one of the first measures that we did was to verify the number of courses, undergraduate and graduate courses that we had in English. Um, and we found out that it was much less than we, um, certainly much less than we wished, and even less than we had expected. So we do have, uh, print in a way has benefited, uh, has uh, incentives for giving courses in English. Uh, one of the commitments that we have taken under print is to offer more graduate courses in English. That's number one. Number two, uh, we have created a minor uh, here at the university in um, international um, studies, we call international studies. Uh, this minor is what we call Formação Transversal, that's a transversal course, so you can have professors from different courses. Courses have to, they need this internationally oriented focus, right? But the, all the courses must be offered in either English or Spanish. They cannot be offered in Portuguese, and many professors have already joined us in that initiative. Uh, the idea of online courses is also a way of improving uh, the number of courses in English, right? It's an, I, we believe it's another, um, it's something else that will help uh, improve the number of courses in English. And finally, uh, I'm glad to, very proud to say that uh, Professor Davis and I proposed also two years ago the summer school, and one of the objectives that we had with the summer school was to give foreign students a chance of coming here and taking a course entirely in English. So I can think of these uh, initiatives. I share the same um, concern that you have, and we will be working very hard. Um, we have been talking also to the British Council uh, in order to, because sometimes you, you speak English perfectly, but delivering a course in English might be a challenge for some of our professors, right? So there will also be uh, uh, a training for some of our professors who, who want to, of course, on how to offer courses in a foreign language uh, offered by the, the British Council. So those are some of the initiatives of the top of my mind that I can think of. I don't know if Professor... Uh, just, just to tell you that Brazil belongs to that proud set of countries where not even 10% of the population, the respective population, uh, speaks some English, some decent, proficient English. 
there are not too many countries with the same profile in the world, maybe some 30 or 40 countries uh, out of 200. So it's a difficult starting point. I mean, we have to actually, we, we, we come across a lot of difficulties in uh, going global. This is not an easy process for Brazil. For Brazilians, you know, we are all surrounded by Spanish-speaking countries. Well, there is Guyana in the north. It's the one and only English-speaking country in South America. And, but still, we are struggling with it, and we aim to, to come up with practical operational solutions. For instance, Professor Saliba is heading to Brasilia in the coming week, and it will be we are already holding conversations with the U.S. Embassy in order to make FMG a, a reference place for language learning for the sake of internationalization. We are also having conversations for some while with the British Council, with Canada languages. So, yes, we, we, we have it in mind, and we will keep your, your nice intervention, we will keep it in mind, because we believe this is one of our main priorities for 2019, 2020, and for the years to come. I mean, this is really important, something we have to cope with urgently. Uh, I mean, uh, I just, I forgot about uh, my trip to Brasilia next week. Uh, I thank <laughs> Professor Davison for reminding me of that. But uh, one, uh, he also forgot, we both forgot about something else, which we are very proud of. Uh, we. We also worked uh, very hard for that. Um, only two universities in Brazil, uh, uh, until one year ago, only one university in Brazil had a Fulbright chair. That was the University of Sao Paulo. Now we are the second university in Brazil to have a Fulbright chair. Uh, we have talked to, uh, to, the, to Humba from the Chinese government. We'll be the first university in Latin America to have a chair uh, a Hanban chair, that is a, a chair partially funded by us and partially funded by uh, the Chinese government in order to have professors from China, but they will be obviously delivering the courses in English. Uh, the number of Mandarin speakers here at the university, uh, although we have about, we've had about 600 students uh, but it's uh, still uh, fairly small when compared uh, to English. So there are also these initiatives which we are very proud of and would like to share with you. Very quickly. Uh, I think that's a very important issue. Uh, language is really indeed, uh, it's indeed a very uh, strong, strong issue. Just a little bit of uh, our experience across the street. This situation might be a catch-22, in a sense. If you do not have any foreign student in your classroom, why are you going to teach that in English, right? Okay, that's one point. Now, I think, I believe, just, just believe, that uh, as you saw, you have many faculty. They got their PhD abroad, and many of them in English-speaking countries, okay? So we do have a large number of professors that should be able to teach in English, okay? Now, uh, we had some experience with that uh, in the, uh, the computer science department in two ways. We had uh, some programs with uh, NSF Pyre, where you have some students, uh, North American students, and the classes where they attend, some of them rather not have it in, in English, believe it or not, they want to have it in Portuguese. But those who want to have it in English, it was, we had no problem with that, okay? But one thing that may foster this initiative is when you have a professor from abroad coming here and teaching a course in English, right? So the two things may happen. So this part I think we may be able to handle, and this again is a, 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 an issue of getting matured about it. But another concern I talked to Professor Sandra about, which is more delicate, is the staff. How many of our staff actually speak English to give support to those students, okay? And I was very glad to hear from her. There is a program. Uh, they, so I, I'm going to let them talk about it, which is really very, very important. 
In other words, to train our staff, which normally do not speak a second language, to be able to speak English, to actually assist those who come from abroad. So I'll let Professor Salib explain that. I have, as, as you can see, uh, 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 we've been very active uh, in the last eight months, and sometimes we forget uh, of some of the things we have uh, began, but uh, uh, Professor Marcel also deserves some credit for that. We began a program. Uh, we, we, we do have courses which are offered uh, by and large to students um, of different languages, uh, especially English, uh, Spanish, French, Italian, German. Uh, but we, th we were very concerned. Uh, we shared the same concern with Professor Mario, and we decided to begin a course targeted at our staff. So people who, first of all, people who work in the international office, and then people who would have uh, any sort of uh, encounter with foreign students so that they could speak English, give basic information, and so on, right? And obviously, there will be, uh, we'll provide them further training for free if they want to. So, I don't know if there are further, yes. Oh, may, may, um, may I come back on the, the way you evaluate the success of this uh, kind of program? Uh, because I think uh, um, I wouldn't like to be provocative, uh, professor, but I think... Oh, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we cannot see your name from here. Oh, so. yes, so sorry. Uh, I am Yves Leroy. I'm from France. Um, maybe I'm the, the only one here who is not a professor. Uh, I'm a doctor. I work for a National Institute of Research of, in Agriculture, the, the, the equivalent of Embrapa in, in Brazil. So um, from my point of view, uh, it's, it's very important to have a success in terms of numbers of papers and impact of papers and so on, impact of science. But in INRA, we, we, we used to say we make science an impact. So science is to produce knowledge, to have a good impact, academic level, and impact is for um, the, how useful is our research for society, and including the industry, of course. And uh, from my point of view, I'm very proud to say that uh, uh, half of the PhD degrees that goes out of my lab have a job even before they have defended in the industry. So employability of people who have been brought abroad by you should be a criteria, a criterion to evaluate the success of this uh, of this interna internationalization. No, what do you think about that? Sorry, just want to make sure I, I understood the question. Uh, you're suggesting that one of the metrics that we can use would be basically the number of uh, graduates, PhD graduates, that actually go to industry, or something like that? Or, or those that easily find a job, or a permanent position, or a job afterwards, if within the five years following their PhD, for example. Um, that's a tough one, because I, uh, there's so many, um, as far as I can see, uh, if you consider the economic situation in Brazil, where we have basically two, uh, 12 million people unemployed, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to remove the bias that will be in that data. You know what I mean? Yeah. They did not get a job because of what? Because of unemployment rate? Because of what? So, but you touched a very, very important point. I didn't, I didn't show that, uh, that slide here. But if you look at uh, uh, where are the PhDs or the graduate students in Brazil, you're going to see the majority of them, in terms of jobs, they're going to academia. If you check Korea, for instance, the, like 70% of them actually in industry. So the point is why, why our industry is not uh, hiring PhDs? That's a question that we have. Part of it we may know why, but part of it we don't know. Actually, that's, that's one of my frustrations, personal. I'd like to see more and more of the students, please understand me, not thinking about being a professor, okay, but actually going to industry. But somehow, that's my limit, 
limited view, my personal limited view. I don't really see uh, at present uh, a feasible way to, to make this happen in Brazil yet, yet, because there's a major, uh, major bias, if I could say in this data, that is imposed by the economic situation. Second, as I mentioned to you before, many of the, for instance, the um, computer industry, information science industry, a lot of it happens outside, abroad. Many of our students, actually, they are hired abroad. The computer science students, right, their market is Silicon Valley. So many of them, many, really many of them actually went abroad, they didn't stay here, okay? So this is something that uh, is a little bit more complicated. Uh, that's my limitation of my perception, okay? But, that, but, but that's extremely good point. Uh, I, I have also uh, another comment on the, um, the time frame to evaluate the success of this story. Uh, I also collaborate a lot uh, with China, and China have this uh, bamboo root theory. So when you put a, a root of bamboo uh, in the ground, you can wait for years and years before you see the first bamboo to grow up. But once there is one that grow up, you have a forest of bamboo. So uh, just put the seeds and uh, don't be in a rush to evaluate your program. Let me just react to this lovely comment. Uh, because, yeah, of course, I tend to agree with you uh, in regard to the, the, the patience and the, the, the need to, to wait for the harvest. Uh, let me just tell you something. Uh, for the first time in our history, we were ranked this year by QS employability ranking. There's something related to employability by QS, right? It was the first time in our history. And we ranked like 400, 350, something like this. But when it comes to alumni, this is remarkable. We were top 100 in the world, which means that our students or our community, uh, they are taking up those Forbes 500 uh, companies. They are taking up leadership positions on these companies, which is impressive. I mean, I, I never thought we were <laughs> that good in <laughs> delivering uh, students of that quality. But when it comes to reputation, then we do bad. I mean, we, we don't reach good scores. So there is this feeling among us that we need to find better ways to make ourselves known around the world. So that matters. We're thinking of ways and we will be coming up with, I mean, tentative solutions in the coming years. But we, we have it, I mean, on the radar screen. We have already identified this problem and we will be thinking of ways to, to deal with it. Hello, I'm Maureen Ehrensberger from Switzerland. And I just would like to pick up on a couple of things that have been said. One, the focus on, on PhDs and PhDs not going into industry. Um, and the, the question about focusing on master students for mobility. Is it possible to write a master's thesis in English? In most of the faculties? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Because that's certainly something you could build on. It's the master's students who are probably going into industry. You've just said that the PhD students don't go into industry. And that's a way of monitoring the mobility as well. So master's students who spent some time abroad, are they more likely to pick up on these positions? Well, I actually have same comment on going to industry for, for PhD students. All of my PhD students, Paul Prost from Leuven from Belgium, um, all my PhD students went out of academia at the moment. And one of the major issues is always languages. It's not only the technical knowledge, the, the scientific knowledge, but often one of the crucial criteria in industry is language, certainly for multinational companies. So I think also in that respect, English is a, is a major issue. Um, I had a, a very specific question on print related to double degrees. Um, 
for us, if we start a double degree at the start of the PhD contract, we have to make a contract for four years. Now, in print, CAPES funds, you, you apply and you have to start your funding in that year. It's not flexible to start like two, three years later. So how can you deal with planning it at the start of the PhD that there will be money in two years to go, a year abroad? It's a practical issue, but I think it's an important point. What occurs to me, uh, there was some uh, wisdom in the way UFMG has conceived its print steering committee because each one of the beneficiaries of print in Brazil, they, uh, they must nominate a group of I mean, people, and in our case, there are six people. Professor Saliba is one of them. So the way we have designed Professor Grant is one of our, one of us as well. So this six people, exactly, the six people steering committee, uh, they are responsible for running the show. And uh, by, I mean, by placing Professor Saliba, who's running the international office, uh, uh, by granting him a seat, we are in a way uh, assuring that there will be some continuity uh, between the strategies delivered by print or thought by print and what the international office will be actually be putting into practice. So what occurs to me, I mean, I, I mean, your question is a bit more complex, but I mean, uh, on our end, we have thought of ways to try to, to alleviate or at least to, to mitigate some sources of discontinuity and of uh, inconsistency. I mean, that, that's what occurs to me. I don't know if you have <laughs> better responses to this. Interesting question. Uh, that, that's very, in a way, coming back to your provocation, right? It's perfect. I think the, the point is well taken. Because let's suppose, I'm not really sure they, they're able to answer uh, this better, but let's suppose all the money for print arrives tomorrow, we get this tomorrow. How fast can we actually implement the, you know, the actions, you know? So somehow, please don't, don't take me wrong, but somehow it's similar to, in that sense, science without borders. Uh, it's not the same thing, please don't take it that way. But I mean that there should be some time for planning and then you start the clock in, in that sense, right? So that should be the best way. But that's a, that's a very good point. Uh, of course, I believe if you, if you check the uh, university community, right, the PhD community, I believe there may be uh, those who are already at this point. If, let's suppose if you get the grant now, they're able to actually take off and go. But I'm not sure uh, exactly the real scenario. I, I don't know. You may, Professor. No, no, so, I, I share the same. I'd say the institutional designs are best insurance. So there, there'll be some lag. Well, uh, we thank, we would like once again to thank you for coming. Thank you for coming to FMG and thank you for coming uh, to this meeting. I hope we can uh, strengthen our relations. Uh, we wish you a great uh, uh, end of the week here in Belo Horizonte and then a safe return back home. Thank you very much. Yeah.